All right. So first of all, thanks a lot for coming on here, man. It's been so long. Like you were just talking about, you and I started together. We were in the same tech school class and, uh, and we were just kind of going through some of the guys we had in there, like Scardino and, yep. uh, Dace of Adria, And those guys are just, uh, some heavy hitters, a lot of good guys. And, um, yeah, I thought that was a pretty good class. We had, it was um, cool. yeah, it was yeah. Real cool. Yeah. Good days. For sure. For sure. Um, but like I said, I'm glad you came on. Uh, I, I wanted to talk to you about kind of what you, how you got into the military and what you've been doing. And because you have a kind of unique career than a lot of us because you went in the guard relatively early. Like it wasn't, yeah. uh, yep. you were only in for a little bit before you. About seven years over. active and then I jumped over. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So that, that was pretty interesting. And then um, obviously, you know, that your, your stuff in the Guyan Valley is, uh, I definitely want to touch on. So yeah. So tell me about it. So talk to me about. Uh, your, you know, before you got in the military, what prompted you to get in and, and we'll just take it from there. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, so I grew up in central Florida. Um, and, and to be honest, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for me there. Uh, uh, I had tried moving out to California and, and hanging with some family and working out there for a bit, uh, out uh, south of LA. Um, but even there, I just wasn't kind of finding my niche. Right. And I had started to join the military, right after high school and then my dad got sick uh, and it looked like it was going south pretty fast so i did so i canceled my delayed entry uh and then so i went out to california tried to find something there came back to florida was working a number of jobs and i was like man it, it's time to just get back into it and then gulf war started to pick up right things were right. happening there and it's you know there's nothing like a conflict to really fire up everyone's patriotism so at that point i was like uh you know the cards are just uh set up right so uh that's when i jumped back in i actually at the time was looking at intel but you remember back in the day we could select TACP. it wasn't like you had to uh do a selection process or anything so right I went in, uh, I went in guaranteed, uh, attack B as crazy as that is. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that was, there wasn't a great story. I just really needed, uh, I really wanted to get in the military at that point. I really needed a path, uh, sure. to, to do some growing. So, so it worked out good. Um, I don't, I don't doubt a second of it military. I wasn't going to grow or I wasn't going to be a real man until I joined the military to be completely honest. So, yeah, I think, he, sure. I think I'm in the same boat. I, I really didn't have a. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't have anything, yeah. you know, on the horizon. I was like, you know what? The military is probably the best bet for me too. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Yep. So I joined, it was cool. Uh, I lucked out actually. Uh, one, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier. Uh, tech school was a blast. I remember after tech school, I was telling everyone, man, I wish my career could have just been, uh, with the crew down, <laughs> down in Fort Walton beach. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, but it, it was a good time. It was a smoker, uh, especially yeah. for a guy who hadn't done a lot of physical stuff prior to that. I wasn't, you know, football teams or any of that kind of stuff. So, um, but it was cool and it yeah. was a huge growth opportunity, honestly, for me. But, uh, my first duty station was Fort, Fort drum, which was awesome. Uh, obviously when you're in Fort drum, it's easy to start complaining about stuff. Cause it gets super cold. Uh, 10th, 10th mountain, uh, was a good team. I, I was with some good battalions there, uh, worked with some good folks, uh, Cole Tharp, Bruce Hunter. Uh, I had some good, oh, yeah. uh, learned from some good people there. Uh, and there was a lot of neat transition, you know, the air cav thing was picking up where there were attack pieces assigned to some, uh, some birds. So it was kind of a neat time to be there anyways, but, uh, I had, that was a good tour. Yeah. Went from there to, to Germany uh, again. I was at an ASOC, but I'll tell you, man, I loved it there. Phil Godet was my boss. You ever run into him? I've heard the name. I don't think we've ever crossed paths, though. Awesome, awesome supervisor. Great boss. He was like old school tack B blood. He really was. Uh, he was a great dude. Learned a lot from him. Learned a lot about, um, you know, he told me once, uh, find out where there's no experts and make yourself an expert. So it was just some real good leadership and it was real nice to get. Um, but it was a good, it was a good crew I was with there. A few of them uh, went on to get commissions and such. And uh, yeah, it was a cool time. I also met uh, a bunch of the cats. I ended up uh, becoming better friends with on down the road, like Keith Hunt and some of these dudes. I met them uh, in Germany, it, like uh, just running around the country, uh, yeah, and yeah. then at the uh, pre-lightning challenge comps. I can't remember if we had a name for those things back then, but uh, there was a good group of folks in Germany uh, in the mid-90s, so it was cool. Yeah. Um, and then I went to Fort Lewis, another lucky thing. Oh, and Schropp. Yeah, so I saw you had oh, Schropp right. on here, too. Yeah. Uh, Man, we were thick as thieves back in the day. He was a fun dude to be stationed with, for sure, uh, oh, yeah. and obviously his badass uh badass romance for sure right right um 
but uh, I went to Fort Lewis after that, which was a good assignment. Uh, um, I loved doing 25th ID, even though we still had to wear the freaking Manchu hair, uh, which was embarrassing. Uh, did, did you ever see that with the helmet? Yeah. Man? God, that was yeah. ridiculous. Um, but uh, but that was that was a good one too. Uh, I've ha I've been pretty blessed uh, with my uh, career there. I actually got out then. Uh, after Fort Lewis, um, I was ready, honestly, to get out, go to college, do my thing. Um, and I did. I had, well, I did a palace chase and I went into traditional guard status where I was just doing the weekend thing. Okay. And uh, uh, I, ha I had some jobs. I had, a I was doing a machinist gig up uh, near Seattle and uh, I hated it. <laughs> I, I like I like doing I like working with my hands. I like making stuff, but I want to do it in my garage, not with a bunch of whiny people who don't want to commit, don't have any work ethic. And it was just, you know, you know how it is. It's just a oh, total yeah. different environment. So I was like, what the hell am I doing? So I started working full time uh, with the uh, guard and eventually got to an active duty slot, which is kind of the best in a lot of ways in both worlds because I oh, still yeah. could work towards retirement. Didn't have to PCS every couple of years, but uh, still was. Uh, still had green and blue in my blood again, so it was so it was nice. Um, yeah. And that was my career moving forward from there. I stayed in the guard, active, uh, changed around a bunch, but um, yeah, it was pretty cool. That was a good move. And you were the one sixteenth. Uh, so that, that was time? my first. Yeah, that was my first assignment, one sixteenth. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'll I'll jump around a, a little if you want for my guard sure. career because it was it was it's different than some others. Uh, ended up being I I uh, started out. Uh, in the 116th, was there a long time. Uh, after a bit, uh, um, and after my deployment in 03, I took a hiatus and was uh, working for an information warfare aggressor squadron. Uh, <laughs> and I actually had to become a cop, if you can believe it. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and I don't, I don't catch crap about that every day, amazingly. Uh, a couple <laughs> people jive me every once in a while, but I had a choice. It was either calm, intel, or uh, security forces, and at least security forces, I could, uh, um, at least I could shoot guns and stuff every once sure, in a while. Sure, sure. But um, we did uh, red teaming. You ever hear of uh, red teams? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And testing. So really, that's yeah. what we were doing. Uh, I never did, like, guard mount or uh, worked at gates or anything. Um, rather, that's a cool gig. Yeah, it was pretty neat. So we would just go in and test the security of facilities and operations and stuff by trying to see how we could kind of get in. So yeah, yeah, yeah it was cool. Test and I don't know. I'm going to get too far into it, but I mean, it, there's a lot of bases that need that kind of testing. Frankly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's and it's a big industry now. In fact, I joked that I think it was my two and a half years or so uh, in that job that probably got me the job I'm in. Uh, more than oh, right on. more than uh, the remainder of my 26 years. So, <laughs> but that's okay. It's all good. Sure. Uh, after that, I uh, came back to the ASOC uh, in the guard there, the 111th, and uh, was there a bit. Then I moved up to the group and kind of finished things off. I was at the ASOC a long time, though. I want to say I was there six or so, or a few more years, uh, six, okay. seven years, something like that. Uh, so yeah, about six years. So you were at the, at the guard ASOC? It was, yeah. So, did, how did you? Were you guys employed that often, or how was how did that work? Yeah, so uh, I had a full time gig there. So there's there were about seven people that are there every day, um, and uh, we supported um, the one sixteenth. Uh, there are obviously there's brigades we're assigned to different uh, sure. uh, guard brigades. It, back in the day, you would have like the one sixteenth that would support four uh guard brigades because there were so few guard a uh uh by the time i was uh getting into my guard career that was uh breaking down to about two uh brigades and uh yeah so we were pretty busy we'd get called on you know the pacific northwest there's a uh quite a bit of uh activity and exercises and stuff going on both here sure. overseas uh so um yeah we were pretty busy but um by the time i got there you know a lot of the uh a lot of stuff was just spin up right uh yeah um so i got there and they were kind of spinning up for their third afghanistan deployment uh and <clears throat> i just missed their 
their second one. And so uh, they were spinning up. Mind you, it's a long spin up, but the way things were changing and a lot of the technology and now they were doing data link stuff and they hadn't prior. Oh, yeah. So um, it was a, a lot of change going on when I joined the ASOC, but it was cool. It was, yeah. it was neat to be back. Uh, I learned a lot at ASOCs, man. I, I love my ASOC time because there's a whole bunch of uh, smart, uh, airspace and management stuff that that I didn't get when I was learning to do peels and and, and just rucking overnight and all day long and stuff like that. <laughs> right. So there's different learning curve, but it was cool. Oh, for sure. I, I don't think I've ever talked. I mean, I think young guys have a trouble there because they want yeah, to get out and get after it. But yeah. older guys have always said like they it's a real eye opener. You know, it gives them yeah. a lot more uh, kind of a broad view of the battlefield and that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah for sure, it was cool. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and then I ended up at the group uh, there on Camp Murray, the guard group, 194th, uh, and uh, I had made chief at that point, so I was uh, kind of finished up my tour. I was not even there uh, maybe just about a year uh, before I retired, okay. uh, and I knew I knew I was going to have a med board coming up, so I was like, uh, and I already eligible, so I was like, time to move on. And, sure. uh, and I looked out, I got a job, I landed a job before I retired, so I was like, oh, let's hit the button, so. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I was pretty blessed. Well, cool. Well, let's um uh I know you kind of you touched on a little bit, but let's move back to uh 2003 because there's a this this whole thing is fascinating, but what people might have missed about you and about your career is that you served with an ODA. You were you were you went down to that level and <clears throat> and uh and deployed in that regard. So, let's talk about that. Let's let's sure. just move back to that uh, to that guy in the valley um story and yeah, I'd love to hear about it. Sure, no problem. So, uh, yeah, O three, obviously, um, I, I know, I know your crews had been uh, turning and burning a lot, and so they started looking for augmentees, and that's how I went. Right, I had never uh, done the selection thing, and I was never assigned to a uh, a uh, an ASOS that was supporting Rangers or SF. They were looking for. Uh, augmentees because the ops tempo was so high. Right. Uh, so we had kind of a, we're not, we weren't supposed to call it a selection thing. I don't <laughs> know why, uh, but uh, we had kind of a thing uh, the guard did uh, where they took a bunch of people out to Wisconsin, ran them through, and then deployed. I want to say it was 24. And we lost one dude while we were there, unfortunately. Jake Frazier, good dude. Um, but we went over January of 03, I remember, because it was freezing, uh, right? Landed at Bagram. And uh, 7th was getting ready to rip. So there was about, man, two or three months that we were kind of just getting piecemealed out to whomever. So I uh, supported 7th group on a couple different things. Uh, that's where I got started getting my, into my first firefight was a couple weeks in supporting the 7th group uh, operation. And... Yeah. It wasn't until about April that I got assigned to uh, to the Beast uh, crew, uh, 344. Uh, good, good crew. It was kind of cool because they didn't have a ton of experience with uh, JTACs, deploying with JTACs. A um, couple of them had it controlled. One guy had controlled CAS in Panama, you know, uh, and then the uh, the Alpha, I remember the, the team leader, He, I remember him telling me, uh, an experience he had in Afghanistan where someone brought air in too early. So he was a little gun shy to get air oh. involved too much. Um, luckily that changed quick after the first firefight near shows up and, and helps the situation. So we got past that quick, but I liked going in and there weren't a ton of preconceived notions. You know, I just had to show up and I had to earn like every bit of respect I got for sure. Right. Uh, you know how that is, but, but, I, but I had no problem pulling my weight. So it was, it was a good crew. They were cool about learning, cool about teaching. And we started out in Deirawood, which are mostly, uh, you know, warlords and drug factions fighting and stuff like that. Um, right. and, and I think we were doing some good stuff because this team was busy. They didn't stay inside the wire every day. They're out running checkpoints or following up on some, uh, humans or something. They stayed busy, which was really cool. Yeah. Um, but uh, after we were in Darrowood for a while, um, they got uh, the team got pushed to Organy, close to the border, uh, and there was a lot happening there. In fact, I remember there was another team ripping out, and I remember talking to JTAC, and he'd been frustrated because his team had just been sitting inside the wire. Meanwhile, there's an insurgency, you know, an ACM group that's uh, building up because it was so quiet, and for sure right. they had a pretty good foothold 
in uh, Guyan Valley at this point, and they were doing the normal stuff, right? They'd have these attacks on the locals, intimidate them, pay them to just launch random rockets at uh, friendlies or anyone supporting their friendlies. So it was a, a, a mess. Yeah. But we got in there, and uh, we had been hammering on them pretty good, trying to trade them down, pick at them, you know, uh, catching them when they're in the market in the village and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the July uh, 19th gig, so we were uh, we had a pretty good idea of where they were hanging out. We had pretty good humans on where to find them, where they were holding up, how they were moving back and forth across the border. In the Guyan Valley is a pretty treacherous mountainous area you know i've seen it a bunch of times but uh yeah. um it gave them pretty good access across the border so we figured we'd put um it, and i say this like it was my plan right but the right. idea was stick our oda uh up at the end of the valley and then conventional forces were going to sweep through the valley and route uh any uh enemies they found or push them to us so that we could neutralize them um the only problem was uh with the elevation you know airlifting isn't easy and we were kind of a mounted force for the most part for the most part there um and we wanted to be mounted for this so we could have all the big guns sure. uh and so to get to our blocking position we basically had to drive right through the front yard of where these cats were hanging out oh um so it was dumb and we knew we were <laughs> we knew we were going to catch it uh on the way in uh we figured we would catch it a lot more than we did um, but it's like an eight, nine or something hour, uh, drive, uh, to leave the fire base and get to where we're going, yeah. um, through the mountains. So really looking forward to that one. So a requested <laughs> air had a plan. So we'd have escort and I'd have uh, air on station to go do some reconnaissance every once in a while and that whole thing. Um, and it was working out good. Um, I'd say we were about, man, five hours in or something like that uh when we passed through a village clearly an unfriendly village clearly this uh insurgency group had a good foothold or at least stranglehold there uh and as we're leaving this village you know there's one road in one road out on the other side right. um uh two trucks uh jam past us pulling around us two hiluxes right full of males of fighting age in the bed in the bed of the truck so it's like well <laughs> they saw us they're going to set up ahead of us i mean it's clear what they're doing right. um, but you know roe we can't stop them or do anything they have to move on so at that point we just uh you know we just got a little salty uh got hyper vigilant and uh um of course because of the nature of the roads and the terrain there we were on a, a mountain road and we were at a place where there's some s curves um high terrain to our left it dropped off to our right and then i would say uh, 100 to 150 meters across the ridge to our right was more high ground <clears throat> and uh we were moving along and i was in the commander's vehicle i was actually in the turret uh and uh, had another bravo in the back and uh yeah the commander and a driver uh and then we had a it was basically three us gmvs and then three amf trucks is how we were how we were moving okay and uh, so we started hearing a few shots pop off, of course. Um, and we stopped, of course. I was already swinging around the, uh, my turret so I could get targets with the Mark 19 is what I had. Um, uh, 40 mil grenade launcher. And um, that wasn't for you. <laughs> Sorry. Right, I, I, uh, I appreciate it. No, a lot of yeah. people give me that feedback. They're like, what are these acronyms you're saying? No, so no, I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um so I was swinging around and honestly, I couldn't even make out targets yet. So I just start suppressing areas where it seemed like I'd be shooting from, right? Obvious sure, sure. Uh, place for, uh, so along the ridgeline, I found some wadis with some brush uh, and I just start suppressing. Uh, but I didn't realize at the time we were kind of stuck in the, in the kill zone because the vehicle ahead of us, one of the AMF dudes had been shot in the back. It collapsed his lung and he fell out. So they uh -huh. stopped. The driver got out to check him out. And all the other dudes in the back of the truck dropped their weapons and crawled under the vehicle. Oh, no. Uh, oh, yeah. It was awesome. <laughs> oh, jeez. So, but the driver was actually kind of a, a badass because um, he, he had a weapon. And he I remember he was just – he came over to our vehicle after they secured the other dude. And our driver was uh, an old Delta. And so yeah. he went to help him. And uh, so the driver of that vehicle, some uh, just some Afghani guy, he wasn't even paid as a fighter. But he grabbed – 
uh, the rifle. And I remember he was just laughing and taking cover and popping up and shooting. And I was like, dude, this guy's had too much cot or something. Cause it was pretty funny, but he was committed. It was pretty badass. So, but, uh, so I swung my weapon around and, uh, I emptied a whole can, uh, and then I was going to reload and, uh, this is I started feeling some burning on my belly, right? Uh, which was flatter back then, but I could feel something hot there. And I was like, what the hell? And then it was getting distracted. It was starting to hurt. So I reached behind my belt buckle and pull out. And I had, uh, uh, not the, um, when I pulled it out, I heard something fall. All I had in my hand was a, the copper jacket, but the bullet ended up falling onto the, into the vehicle. Okay. And it was around, had probably gone through, um, either the Mark 19 or the vehicle or something and then hit my vest. But, you know, you've got your body armor and there's the plate that's in there, but there's about this much room yep. that isn't covered by that trauma plate. It hit right there, Jeez. but over my belt buckle. And oh, so okay. it didn't penetrate as weird as that is. Yeah, man. I remember Cause I remember picking it up and thinking about what happened. I'm like, Holy crap. Uh, and then I'm like, shake it off. And I dropped it. And then I got back to reloading. And, uh, that's when I realized, uh, my, uh, the weapon wouldn't, wouldn't, it was malfunctioning. And I tried going through all the drills. I remember at one point, I'm even very slowly while freaking rounds are picking off all over the place, trying to concentrate, make sure, you know, the tray, everything in the tray lines up good. And I'm like, okay, well the weapons, it, it didn't work. So finally it was like, it's down. I had my M4, uh, bungee corded uh at the base of the mark 19 in front of me and so just as i'm starting to grab it that's when i got hit um and fell down and i didn't even realize i got hit right um i just know suddenly i i've been knocked into the turret and you do the normal check and then i could see a couple spots i'd gotten shot in the arm and then some pieces of metal and stuff hit my wrist and elbow and shoulder. So I could see the b blood forming on my sleeve. Yeah. So then I'm like, oh, I'm hit. Uh, and the driver's right there. He pulls me out, helps uh, tie me up. And uh, then I saw the Bravo who'd been in the back. Uh, he'd been shot through the leg. And his ammo had gotten all twisted as he tried to dismount with the 240. So he had to abandon that. So mm. I was outside the vehicle with no weapon and no radio with this. Well, I had a pistol, but yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> luckily there were a bunch of AK 47s on the ground. So <laughs> that was handy. Uh, so I had an AK 47 for a little bit, uh, but I had to get a mic to get the air back. And I forgot to mention this part um, about 10 minutes, I'd say. Before this ambush kicked off, uh, another fire base, which was uh, in this part of the region, uh, had a rocket attack. Oh, man. So the uh, AV-8, uh, a brand new mission had just checked in, some Harriers. They got redirected over to this fire base that was getting the rocket yeah. attack. And then... I mean, was, they needed it, but... Yeah, it, right. It but it, for you. It yeah. was literally like 10 minutes, too. I mean, it was oh. so... And, and I remember we would talk about it later. We're like, was that on purpose? I'm like, these cats had never shown that level of sophistication in their planning. Oh. So I just think it's more the luck of the day, you know? So yeah. uh, so it took a while. You know, I I, uh, I called back to Siege Soda, uh, uh, told him, uh, reported the tick. Um, and we were still trying to recover people and get ammo and get weapons and stuff. So I reported the tick, set the mic down. We took care of some things. Uh, air was inbound. Uh, and so I needed a radio, though. And uh, this was when, you know, we were going in theater and, oh, you're not going to need 113s or 77s. Here's the 117. <laughs> Learn it. You have a week, right? It was yeah, one of those yeah. things. Didn't have embitters yet. Well, my 117 is up on the turret where I strapped in my ruck. I have a quick release. But I'm not getting anything off there right now because the turret's right uh, taking all the fires. So, sure, sure. Um, and so I had used the commander's radio and mic uh, to call in the air. But I grabbed an embedder from our driver. He had an embedder, no mic or headset or anything. But so I'm almost like I'm on a freaking cell phone <laughs> trying to talk to the air. But it worked out. It worked out good. Sure. Um, so they started uh, um, checking in. I kind of talked them onto our position. And uh, we were close, right? We were easily about 100 meters, if that. Yeah. Uh, and, they, you know, they show up with five-inch Zunis. The Harriers do it. I'm not going to use those. And they had a laser guide bomb. not used. So it was pretty much just strafe runs. Um, but they did one pass to make sure they were on track. 
And I said, yes, that's a good pass. And then we start catching some fire again, right? So I had to put this, my walkie talkie, if you will, <laughs> how I'm using it. I just set that down um, and uh, and start, because, uh, you know, I had one arm, right? The My wounded arm, I just kind of clipped into the top of my kit. So I was like, weapon mic and so i just set that down but what was cool is while i'm returning fire it probably it seemed like three seconds but it was probably like seven minutes or something they didn't hear anything um and so i think they thought we were getting slaughtered and i know now because i saw them later uh um the in their marine pilots right they they get oh, ground yeah. combat so they came in over the deck and i mean they were that was the lowest damn flight i've ever seen in my life and that was a harrier came screaming across because they were like we didn't hear anything so we just wanted to break it up so they came shooting across the deck nice. um yeah it was pretty sweet so uh after that uh i had them do another run they started doing some strafe runs along the ridge line uh which of course didn't take too long to to break things up um and we still, so we had the AMF vehicle in front of us and then our vehicle on this little mountain road stuck in, in the kill zone. So now we're going to try to break contact, but we don't know where anyone else is, right? We don't know if they're uh, engaging with fire and we don't want to roll, roll around a corner and get lit up. So sure. I start trying to talk to the other vehicles. And the vehicles, the vehicles in the front, if I remember, they had pretty much cleared it. Uh, and they had set up a position and they were just trying to maintain contact and, and get status and stuff like that. Vehicle, uh, two vehicles in trail were actually engaging uh, as they could. One of the dudes actually got shot um, uh, through the vehicle and caught some shit in his face and his nose. Um, but they were uh, still working targets, but I was trying to bring them to where they could get their, their 50 cal more on where we were at because that was in uh where the main position was so um so i started talking to them describe where we were and i was like i'll pop a flare so i I had a an ammo box with a bunch of right uh alum and stuff and so i took this stupid thing took the cap off popped it on there boom on the vehicle boom on the ground on my hand nothing and i remember the face of the of our team leader he's like and i could just hear this Air Force, you're right. I could I could sense him saying that. He snatches it from me, bam, bam. Nothing from him either. So he hands it. He's like, "Oh, don't worry about it." Hands it back to me, pissed off. And I take it and I throw it on the ground, and that fucking flare shoots up the damn road. No, (laughs) I was like, I was like, what the fuck is going on, man? So um, so I also noticed uh it's it's look at some point what the shit is going on man i don't even remember exactly where in it but i noticed a bunch of metal fragments on the driver's seat um and it looked like a chunks of a gerber and sure enough i felt my waist and uh i had had a gerber tool on my belt in a a, a cordura sheath and i just had a little cloth left so while i'd been in the turret uh, and taking that one in the vest they'd shot the gerber off my hip so i was like yeah so i was i was like in you know how it is sometimes you get all these fights later you see where all the holes are and everything uh the mark 19 got shot up like three four times the ring had a few holes in it i was like how the hell did i not get hit more um and even you know i'm standing here and in the rear driver's seat we would keep water uh, we had a couple rounds in the water bottles. It was pretty cool. It's like we were doing gel test or something. Uh, but yeah, it was nuts. Uh, uh, probably about after the fact, we realized there were probably about 30, 30 to 40 maybe uh, folks in pretty nice uh, uh, natural cover uh, yeah. just kind of sitting there for us. In, in beautiful terrain, they had the geometry. This wasn't an L. This was like a freaking N. Um, they had us covered real nice. Man, it sucked. So uh, so after um, a control layer, they're starting to break off. We're starting to recover vehicles. Uh, our driver for the vehicle ahead of us uh, tries to turn around for some reason and gets it stuck. So the, the SF guy who had gotten shot through the leg, he was an old ranger. Like yeah. one of those crusty old rangers probably right. went to ranger school in the 70s. So <laughs> he's he's got his uh, leg bandaged up. It was a through and through, but he still got shot in the leg, right? And yeah. he goes around, he's pushing this thing. I was like, back it up. And he's up against the mountain with his legs, pushing this freaking truck out of a ditch after he gets shot in the leg. I was like, geez, man. And he's not like a big giant dude. He's just one of those crusty old uh, guys that you know, if anything 
goes to hell in an apocalypse, he's going to be the one you want to hang out with. Right. Sure. So, yeah, yeah. so, uh, so we start to get recovered there. Uh, and then some, uh, some Apaches showed up on my, uh, on my net on the radio. Nice. I didn't request those. What I think happened and what I'm pretty sure, and I don't know if I ever asked the dude, uh, Hoover, I'm pretty sure it was Hoover who was back okay. uh, at our firebase. Um, I think he pushed me some uh, some uh, Apaches when he heard stuff going down and heard that okay. I was waiting for uh, air to get back. I think he pushed me the Apaches uh, because tr- they I didn't request them and they were given my tad. Uh, and so I'm, I forget how I came to that conclusion, but at some point I, I was checking things out. So uh, that's what's cool about the career field. Uh, yeah. So and uh, so I got the Apaches, but we didn't need to engage any targets at this point. We just had them look for an HLZ. Uh, cause we had, um, uh, three of our guys wounded, two were medevac. Um, and then our AMF guy was in pretty bad shape. So we start, uh, breaking contact. I got back up into the turret, uh, with an M4, uh, <laughs> and we start exfilling, um, uh, an Afghani in the back of the truck who had, who had just loaded up because we're trying to uh, scramble out of there has an ad about to shoot my head off so that would have been brilliant oh no kidding no kidding because <laughs> it, it scared me enough i was i was caught back i was like what the f-? and then I, was, I wanted to crawl back there after all that out. yeah oh yeah Jesus. it was ridiculous it was ridiculous <laughs> um but we uh yeah we we jam out of there uh we uh link up with the other tr- with the other trucks the other parts of the convoy and then we uh, get to an hlz um uh my team sergeant was a former medic him and uh the one medic we had with us we only had one at the time because another one ripped yeah uh uh they did a chest tube on this guy at the hlz and everything it was brilliant too and i found out later while i was in the hospital with with the afghani dude uh they didn't need to redo anything it was done perfect like on the sand out in the desert after getting everything shot up they're just they were good uh it was a good team great medics um Great, great all the way around. But uh, yeah, we got out of there. Spent uh, me and the other Bravo got shot through the leg. Spent a night in the hospital, and then we went back to the team. Um, they wanted to keep us longer, but it was there was no no real point to it. Might as well get back with the team. We can get the care we need yeah. from the Deltas. So so that was pretty much it. I'm sure there's stuff I left out, little details that are either funny or or. Uh, embarrassing but I, I can't recall any hips yeah that's an amazing story man that, that i was reading through it you sent that the buy over and the thing that struck me the most was that you know a lot of us I, we want to say that we would react like the way you did but who knows but you you did man you got shot you got you were getting things shot off you your primary weapon was getting shot and you just still kept after you just still did the you and that you know, you talk about that ranger that uh you know the old ranger the crusty guy that was you know shot and he was pushing yeah. the truck you're in that same caliber guy. You're the same. You're in that same group. You were, you just continued to fight, and I, I think that's commendable, man. And not to mention, I don't know if people don't know this, but you got you got a silver star for yeah. for this for this engagement. Not to, a purple heart too, but yeah, the, the 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 heroism that you did on that day was just phenomenal, man. No, I appreciate it, dude. Uh, I uh, look, uh, you know, decoration stuff and in earning the decorations often you're lucky. Uh, I think I was lucky a lot of ways, a lot of ways that day, but I was also lucky with the team and this isn't that, uh, uh, pedantic, you know, modesty stuff. I really was, I was with a great team. Uh, yeah. it was, uh, probably one of the best army, uh, units I've supported in my career. Hands down. I stay in yeah. touch with some of them. I don't stay in touch with anyone good. No one. Right. But I was recently on a trip. I got to uh, hang out for the afternoon with the crusty old ranger guy. He's doing like a uh, Robert Sage or something. He's still in the game though, right? He's oh, okay. uh, is a contractor. Um, so uh, yeah, I got to see him for a little bit <laughs> and hear someone who's uh seems like you're a great guy your grandpa man he's gonna see this and kick my ass because he probably still can but uh um but but he's just an old head right it's just cool to to hang out with these guys but i learned a lot from them and and uh you know a lot of folks will will say you know uh, um why they you know muscle memory kicks in man there wasn't necessarily muscle memory kicking in i will tell you every time i got into a firefight or i had to keep All the good decisions I made in Afghanistan during that deployment is because I didn't want to let down the folks that I was working with, and I didn't want to embarrass myself in the eyes of the folks 
I was working. You know, I didn't want to be seen as a weak link. Right. Uh, and I didn't want to be seen as someone who something up and someone could have paid, paid the price. Real, yeah. It was really that simple. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't, I sure don't think, look, we've, uh, we've seen some of the dudes who've gotten decorated in our uh, career field. Some of them, you're not surprised at all. Some of them, you're like, somehow I knew it, you know, you wouldn't yeah. have, you wouldn't have guessed it because, uh, like me, we're, there's a bunch of goofballs around, uh, <laughs> not the fastest runners. They can't necessarily shoot the best or, or whatever. Um, but you know, as long as their heart and shit's in the place and they get, get work done, that's what matters. And so what, well, I think like you said, I think it boils down to, I, I, you, you say you don't want to embarrass yourself, but I think it, it's more leans more towards, you don't want to, you, you want to protect because that's what a tech piece job is. A JTEC yeah. job is to the only reason we're even there is to protect those guys that can't protect themselves. And that's yeah. what you did. Yeah, and I think that, I think your upbringing, you know, in that, the guy, your, you know, the guys you mentioned that you were exposed to and they had a, had a hand in your development. I mean, it speaks volumes about the career field. I mean, you guys like you get in that situation, guys like you guys like Shrop, you get in these situations and that, that instinct to protect your unit just kicks in and you guys kicked ass, man. I mean, it just, I, I think it's amazing. I think you guys, that was a phenomenal thing you did. And I yeah, I, like I said, I think you were just, it's, it was that inherent, you know, kind of feeling to do your job and protect the guys that you're in charge of. And I, I say in charge of, but like, you yeah. know, cause when, at that point you kind of are, you know, at the, yeah. at once, once, once it all breaks down, you're the, you're the guy they're looking to, to, to help out. So. Well, I think, yeah, I think charge is exactly, I mean, that's how I looked at it. Not like I was in charge of like leadership, but charge that what they were my charge, you know, right. the forces we, I even, tell, I even tell my honey all the time. I'm like, baby, you're my charge. And she's like, <laughs> right. what, what are you talking about? But it's the <laughs> right. same kind of thing, right? I'm sure. indebted to make sure everything works out for whomever uh, I'm, I'm there to support. So, right. So yeah, I think charge is totally appropriate. That's how I always saw sure. it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's nothing cosmic. It's nothing like too dramatic. Yeah. It's just, that's, that was our job to, was yeah. to protect those guys. And yeah, for sure. You, and you did it, man. You, you nailed it. You really, really did it. Yeah. I appreciate um, it. so then, uh, so did anything happen after that? Like, I mean, that's plenty of things to go on in Afghanistan, but did, did you run any other scrapes during that? Yeah, there was, or? yeah, there was some stuff. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, that was, well, I know. I guess that one even had some. Uh, it's funny with every every firefight. There's something in there that makes you think back and say, "How the hell did that happen?" Or, "God, that's ridiculous." But there were a couple of there. There was uh, the the very first time I saw a uh, fire was uh, um, we had only been around a couple weeks, and there was a huge operation. We went into Bagran Valley uh, down south more, um, okay. and uh, there were probably. I want to say four ODAs and ODB and a couple Navsoft teams. This was huge. It was some big cat in the, with Hig, uh, Hezbi Islami, uh, uh -huh. Gobaldine crew. Um, I want to say, it, I, I think that's who it was for this. And we went down there. We spent about two weeks on the road. We, we went down, uh, got a bunch of human from sources. They had already worked out, right. They already had, uh, their sources so we tracked those folks down and then we found the village we needed to go to and rolled into there um but when we rolled into this valley there was a huge gator back big old walls um on either side this was a nasty nasty place and there were probably a hundred or more people waiting for us Jeez. and that uh i remember seeing the first rpg sail in front of our vehicle i was in the back of a up armor which i never want to do again it feels like you're rolling around in a casket when you can't fight back and you're just working radio that is not the way to go yeah. um but uh we rolled in there and, and that got pretty uh crazy um we didn't lose anybody amazingly um but the the air i remember we had some uh was it dutch or danish um f-16s that had crap for sensors crap for uh even ids or gps location uh yeah. they didn't speak english so basically we oh, spent geez. about 40 minutes of trying to work some casts to no end until the a-10s showed up but most of the yeah. firefight was gone then so we basically just shot through this this alley uh getting everything shot up um there was a probably a dozen JTACs uh, throughout this crew, us and uh, a couple Navy. And uh, we hung out at a fire bay. We overtook a compound, made that our new 
fob, right? Yeah. Uh, and hung out there a while. But uh, I, w- I was talking to get to this one night hop where uh, I was with the ODB team. And so uh, our team in one ODA, we had to go out to a village and uh, and puck somebody uh, and bring them in, get some human. And um, knew it was going to be kind of nasty, right? So we had rolled and at night. And uh, uh, as we're moving in, uh, we were already getting fire, but it's in the middle of a village, right? Uh, so yeah. it's kind of... Um, it's it's very chaotic, right? Because you never know for sure where it's. There's not always muzzle flashes and all this nice stuff that you see in the military. So, I had an AC-130 gunship overhead, um, and then an RC-12 showed up. Uh, did you ever work with their sensors? Yeah, they're yeah. pretty. Yeah, they're pretty astute. Uh, I yeah. had never ever worked with an RC-12 Delta uh, in in that capacity, but um, yeah. I remember uh, we were able to work our way uh get things done and we were moving out and we would still take some fire <laughs> and uh i remember the guy in the turret is trying to identify targets but right. he's but he's having trouble and next thing i know the gunship says someone's approaching your vehicle anyone approaches the vehicle like on foot you know it's about to go south right sure, that's sure. not a good sign because things are about to go boom and so uh I tell the guy in the tour, I'm like, someone's approaching the vehicle. He's, he's like, what? And then he's asking for information. What sign? So I tell him he's swinging around. He can't see anyone. A lot of dust. Where we were at was that real fine talc kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at night, the, it messes with nods, you know, so it was just harder to see when we got, you know, five vehicles trekking through there at a decent rate of speed. And so the gunship's like, no, they're approaching the vehicle back right, uh, you know, and getting close, about three three feet or something like that. And then I hear this real quiet um, female voice from the RC-12. It's a dog. You know, it was <laughs> real soft. Uh, mine was much bassier, but it was like, and I'm like, you got to be freaking kidding me. So I'm sitting here throwing this guy into high alert. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. And then, then she throws out real matter of factly. Yeah, it's, it's just a dog. So <laughs> yeah, they they could see a lot better than a lot than anybody oh, else. Yeah, there, for sure. it was yeah. nuts. Yeah. <laughs> it was nuts. I was surprised. So I did a lot of requesting for uh, the twelves after that. Um, oh yeah, didn't always get them. We had a lot of gunship. Uh, it was funny. We were sitting in that valley, like I said, for about a, a week before we moved on to the next location. But you'd have these folks that think they're Superman crawl up on the ridge line and think they're going to start sniping at us. And then they get blown to hell, right? Because yeah. uh, we have a gunship and they can hear it. We can hear it. I know they're hearing it. Um, right, right. And then and next night, someone else tries it. I'm like, what are y'all doing? Seriously. And this wasn't even that early in the war. I mean, it was kind of, no. we've been there for a couple of years yes. by then. So the you know, yep. gunship was well yeah. known. And they, it was. Yeah. It was the yeah. weirdest thing. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, no, that, but that was a good, uh, that was a good one. We were pretty lucky there. And I will yeah. also say, at the B team, I was kind of stacking all this aircraft. And if there wasn't anything to do, I would send them out on recon. But I will tell you, after a week, I was controlling air all the time. Like I had to do something with this air all the time because I didn't want to just have it circling. So if I've got it, I'm going to have it looking at something. Right. But it got exhausting, man. So some of the uh, JTACs with ODAs that weren't busy, um, they'd come over and say, Hey man, want me to take the air for a bit. So it was pretty cool. Uh, and even, uh, there were a couple CCT guys supporting different ODAs. They came over to, uh, didn't really see, uh, too much drama or anything, you know, that had been around with the career field. Um, so it was cool. Yeah, it was helpful. Um, it was good. Yeah. Yeah. It gets old when you're the, when you're the single point of, uh, contact for all the aircraft because it's like, you can't, you can't, you got to be up and attentive and you have to, you know, respond to them if they see something or they, you know, whatever. And yeah, it can be exhausting, especially if you're up like all day long. I mean, yeah. And there was stuff at night and I would try to, like I said, I don't want anything to be circling. So I'd try to keep track of what ops for the different OTAs are going the next day. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would try to set up TRPs and so I could have it. So I had something to do with it, but that is like nonstop mission planning. Like for, right. uh, it, that was super i remember because after we got through that first ambush which was nuts it was crazy but after that it was pretty slow i mean i'm sitting in a place where there'd be sniper fire every once in a while but i never really felt threatened honestly um it was just exhausting because of all the daggum work uh planning and controlling and stuff um 
but yeah, that's a, that's a better kind of exhaustion. Right. So, <laughs> right. um, <laughs> for sure. And no one went without air. So, so it worked out good. Yeah, and it, it kind cool. of, uh, harkens back to your ASOC days. I mean, that, uh, that's kind of that role. Yeah. I, mean, I think you did that. At, do we, well, you were at the ASOC before conventional, then you went to, Correct. then you did that and then came. So, I mean, having that skill probably came in handy. Yeah, for and sure. Just that mindset really, you know, yeah. divvy it up and. Yeah, well, and it's funny, too, because even like I was at the ASOC in Germany and <clears throat> we got to do a lot of different kind of casts, you know, because right. we're still trying to control and, and keep currencies or get JTAC certifications. So I'm still trying to control. Okay. And uh, uh, from my first duty station, I was still learning a lot of basics, but then I was learning, you know, it's 10 pound. We were doing a lot of infantry stuff and going to oh, JOTC. Yeah. And, and so it was a lot more army stuff. Um, there was a lot of focus uh, on air. But but we also had a range there, so right right. We you, you end up knowing the range like the back of your hand. That's the advantage right. I think of not having a range at your duty station because you have to go places and 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 break it up more. But uh, because of the variety of scenarios and terrain and aircraft, uh, honestly, I got way better at, at some real basic. Uh, um, uh, JTAC skills like integration uh, and, and stuff like that. Cause we also had these, these teams, they had mortars and they were using them. Um, and although, you know, 60 Mike, um, how they're employed, how they were employing cast still at the time probably was never really going to be a factor, but I'm not going to just use hope as the plan, right? I'm sure. still going <laughs> to go through all that, all that stuff. And I, and I felt real confident in those kinds of skill. Well, I better, damn well have right because i'm a jtac but i but i i really got most of my confidence in germany um because we had some time to go to all these different places do all this different air uh and i had i just had some good trainers there uh yeah. too so yeah it's cool yeah germany uh, did you guys go to grafenbeer at all to do mm -hmm. anything yeah. yeah and hohenfels was a nice venue to yeah. kind of do that kind of stuff yeah. too yeah I, I spent two years over there it was that was really eye-opening because you get exposed to like a lot of cast, but it's foreign stuff. So there's like yeah, right. foreign guys that are, you yep. know, you get a different, different flavor of techniques and, you know, they're all supposed to be the same, but you know, there's that little differences and yeah, it wasn't like a, a 10 line or something or what was the cast? Sort of? Oh yeah. What's it a five, uh, five line or, or it was the NATO one. It yeah. I forget. Yeah, it wasn't too. a nine. It wasn't a nine line. No, but it wasn't, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It was something weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I forget all, man, that, man, that's, uh, that's reaching back. You have a better memory right. than me, my friend. Holy <laughs> hell. Yeah. Would we have to learn three different either. versions of that stupid, uh, uh, thing? Um, yeah, right, right. Some probably had to do more, but yeah, I think I had to learn three different versions um, yeah. of all the same info, basically. But sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank God they've standardized it since then. But yeah, back then it was like, well, which one are we using? And yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, so now you said you got out. So you um, you made chief in the guard, right? And then uh, you got out. And so what did you do? You said that your um, your red teaming kind of got you into your career that you have now. So talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I got out and came right over to Amazon to Amazon Security, and so uh, the org I'm with uh, is responsible for um, evaluating security, uh, physical and some wireless and logical kind of stuff. So okay. not necessarily go into the heavy heavy geek side, right? Network okay. security and logical security, but we're at the cusp. Uh, for the in the wireless stuff is very much um engineering kind of stuff but okay. uh yeah we evaluate uh the security of uh data facility pretty much amazon site or in a lot of services and stuff now too so mm. it at the heart we're kind of an auditing team but there's a whole whole bunch of um uh, elements that go along with it. And, it, and it's interesting because some of the folks I've met when I came over, when I first came over, I, I got into a red team. It was a physical security red team. Uh, and then I went to doing more of the blue team, compliance evaluation, vulnerability assessment kind of thing. Uh, now I'm on a, um, a support team that handles security analytics and uh, data analytics uh, associated with security and some engineering uh, pieces, but um, it's still all about physical security for Amazon sites. But uh, you meet all kinds of people uh, out in the industry. It's a different world, way different world. Uh, luckily, like Amazon has some uh, principles that match up nicely 
with uh, core values. So oh, nice. there's still uh, some some ethical kind of practices and behaviors because if it, uh, there's other uh, organizations, I wouldn't have been able to stick around. Um, but it's good. Uh, the person who hired me, um, I won't divulge too much about him, but I will tell you, uh, I didn't know at the time, but uh, yeah, my hiring manager was uh, uh, in the FBI and he was one of the lead agents on a pretty major uh, terrorism case. Uh, oh, really? So yeah, and then uh, a good colleague of mine uh, uh, was um, SF Medic of the Year one time. He has like nine Purple Hearts. Uh, so there's all kinds of cats you run into uh, on this side uh, uh, out in the industry. So it's pretty neat. Uh, it's pretty yeah. cool. Um, and I like my work. I like my work. Keeps oh, me good. busy. I get to work from home right now. Um, yeah. So it works good for the fam. And sure. uh, yeah, it's cool. I dig it. Nice. I, I again, I was lucky because I had, I ha I got this job like I say as I was getting out. So I took two weeks of turn, uh, two weeks off, and then I jumped right into it, nice. and uh, a lot of terminal leave uh, while I'm working for Amazon. That is, I'll tell you, if you have oh. a choice, do it that way. That was <laughs> yeah. pretty cool. That was good double dipping there. I was gonna say that. Yeah, that makes the bank account look pretty good. I'm yeah. sure. I've, I've fixed that since then, uh, but I balanced <laughs> right. it out. But uh, at the time it was awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so speaking of all that, what uh, do you have? Is there anything you're doing uh, extra, like any kind of um, charities that you are involved with or any kind of, um, you know, any uh, any programs or uh, associations or anything that you are passionate about? So, uh, yeah, there is a uh, um, we have a scholarship fund for a TAC P who passed away. Uh, I was uh, I will send that to you if that's OK. I don't have it. Yeah, handy. for sure. Uh, I'll send you the Facebook page. Uh, the Scott D, Scott T. McDaniel uh, Memorial Scholarship. He was with the 116 ASOS. Uh, he passed away a tragic accident, not combat related, mm -hmm. but he was a good dude. He, you know, you show up to any ASOS, and uh, there's that guy who can figure out everything. Uh, like you get a new radio, he's the first worst per, uh, first person to pick it up and start building the pages for the for the handbook. Right. 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 That was this guy, and he was okay. just a funny, good dude good family man um good guy uh and it was just it just sucked so yeah. we have a memorial scholarship for him um we just uh this last year got our um tax id uh so in 2024 we're hoping to give out a bunch of 500 hundred dollar scholarships so oh great i'll send that info out with the criteria and everything definitely i'll post the social media and um and, cool. and we have it on here and you know, people can be aware of it. Just real quick, how, how would somebody apply for it? Do they just... So on our Facebook page, yeah, on our Facebook page, we have uh, the um, eligibility requirements and the application requirements uh, as well. Um, it's all right there. And then you just uh, can apply through the Facebook page. We don't have a website. We're just working through Facebook. Okay. Uh, and then next year, it, uh, uh, we will have, around the middle of the year, we'll have a uh, review um, of the applicants and choose as many as we have money for. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Man, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to hear about that guy. Um, but it's nice that I see that's the thing. Everybody I talk to on here, that's why I always ask if there's any kind of initiatives or anything, because there's people just give back and it's so, yeah. I mean, it's so really cool to see guys like you and who have, you know, been there, done that, but they, they feel that, they feel compelled to kind of give back to the community. And yeah. I think it's cool, man. It's really commendable. So yeah, yeah I appreciate, appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, dude, this is, this has been awesome, man. This is, uh, I, it was great catching up with you. I mean, uh, like I said, we, we started in the beginning and yeah, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I, uh, sure. you, I was, I really appreciate you taking your time to, to sit down and tell us your story. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating, I, I didn't want to just focus on that, but I definitely yeah. want to hear about it. Cause I like, yeah, I hadn't I, like, I've kind of talked to people on here you know, I know the, I know you. I've known you for a long time. I know a lot of guys, but then we don't always hear these stories. We don't, we don't hear them firsthand. Yeah. And uh, it was really amazing to kind of hear the firsthand account of, of what you went through. And yeah, I appreciate it, and I appreciate this. Uh, um, until you hit me up, I hadn't even listened to any of the podcasts. I mean, I, I'll yeah. I'll get on Facebook and I'll scroll around a little bit, mostly just look at funny stuff or family stuff or whatever. Sure. Uh, but I don't click on too much and I don't post too much. So uh, it wasn't until you reached out that I started hearing from some of the 
uh, stories. And I know some of these cats and I haven't heard firsthand either. Right. Uh, uh, so, um, no, it's cool. It's a good thing. So appreciate it. Yeah. Keep it up, yeah. man. Yeah. Right on. Cool. All right, brother. Well, Hey, thanks again. And, uh, yeah, keep in touch and, um, hey, yeah, send me that info about the, um, the scholarship we'll and I'll post it. Yeah, for sure. We'll do. Thanks a lot, All man. Right, man.